The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. If you are a hockey fan, you are going to want to stick around. We've got Pat Curcio on to talk a little bit about his past career in hockey. He's been all over the world in all kinds of leagues and everything between playing and coaching and now even a sports agent for hockey players. He's got a lot of ama- he's got a lot of amazing stories to tell us and all kinds of things that I think you guys will really enjoy today on Rising to the Occasion. Before we get started today on our episode with Pat Curcio, I want to start off by mentioning our sponsor for today, and that is Calder Lab. Calder Lab is an amazing sponsor. It's also an amazing product. For men who are looking to have better and healthier skin, we encourage you to go over to calderlab.com slash rising2 to check out all of our favorites from Calder Lab. We have used their products, all of us here on Rising to the Occasion, and we absolutely love them. The reason why we love them is because they give the best possible solution for your skincare needs. You want to clean up your face and get uh, maybe some of the, these these old scars off your face. Maybe you've got some signs of aging and wrinkling that you want to do. The good is the perfect solution for that. If you get the entire regimen bundle, there's nothing that you can't do with it. It is going to make your face look amazing. It's going to make you glow. It's going to make you look great, I promise. And they have a guarantee themselves. If you don't enjoy the product 100%, they offer a guarantee on it so you can always return it and get your money back but i promise you you're not going to have to do that i have been using calder lab for quite some time they sent all of us some of their products to try out before we ever signed them on as a sponsor and they absolutely lived up to the hype we were all looking for something that we could use for skincare for quite some time and if we're if we're being honest men we all need skincare we all need some sort of skincare and it's it's time to to take action right now Go over to calderlab.com and you can use code RISING2, that's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O, and you can use that for 20% off. That is a steal. Go over and check them out, calderlab.com. They have an amazing uh, array of all kinds of awesome products. Recently, I've been using the the, uh, exfoliating bar of soap, and it has absolutely cleared up my back knee, all kinds of stuff. It has absolutely helped my skin feel so much softer. My wife loves the products because it makes me look better and it makes her feel better that I'm looking better because she doesn't have to look at me and think what an ugly beast. Instead, she sees a man who's taking care of his skin and doing the right thing by going to calderlab.com and using code RISING2 for 20% off because that's how much we care about you as a listener. Let's get into the episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're very excited to have you and excited to have a new guest on the show, a very special guest, a man who has played hockey for quite some time, and he's also coached hockey all over in different states and all over the world in different countries even. Uh, His name is Pat Curcio. Pat, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here and talk hockey and uh, everything that's going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, We are a pretty big hockey podcast. We don't cover just hockey we cover all sports but hockey is one of the big ones for us uh we've we've we had a blast covering the past uh, nhl playoffs and stuff like that it's just but it's i feel like this past playoffs was one that really got a lot of people back into hockey if they weren't uh into it at all uh it got them into hockey for the first time uh, i was a, it was a very exciting <laughs> exciting year so it's it's an exciting sport and uh i know you're you've got a love love for the game that you've had for quite some time yeah absolutely it started uh Way back, probably just as I learned to walk, I learned to start skating, and uh, it's been my passion since I can remember nothing else. Uh, watching the Toronto Maple Leafs on TV in the in the late seventies, so yeah, <laughs> I, so, re- I remember the days well. So, did so, you grow up as a Toronto fan? Then? <laughs> I did. I did. I grew up with a okay. big Leaf fan, and uh, yeah, we never never really had great teams. We had a couple teams that had a couple good playoff runs. I remember '93 really well with. Doug Gilmore, that was exciting when they lost to LA. We we had a really fun time watching all those games. But yeah, I spent spent the life as a Leaf fan. Yeah, yeah. So you guys kind of had a, a disappointing fizzle at the at the end of the the season this year, huh? 
Yeah, I was in Florida. I got to see the games and went oh, to, really? down to watch them at live arena here in Florida. And uh, yeah, you know, Florida they just uh, between their goaltending and their defense, and yeah, uh, obviously Kachuk was unbelievable. Just such a clutch guy. This playoff uh, that they were just they were just better. They were just yeah. better. They found ways to be better, and uh, what an exciting run for them. Yeah, that was something too that we kind of explained was like it was just weird with Florida because they're this team. Usually they're put into the playoffs. Like if we if we back up a season ago, they were put in the playoffs as a number one seed. So they're kind of expected to be in that position. But this year it seemed like they had to fight and claw their way into the playoffs. And so they were already on that role going into the playoffs. And then, you know, being able to take down Boston, that was a huge uh, victory for them. And then being able to go into the second round and handle business there. And it just seemed like they got better and better. Uh, And, of course, a disappointing uh, end of the season for them as well. But uh, to make it as far as they did, I think that's still a very successful season. It was unbelievable. I can tell you a story. I was having dinner with uh, Rick Dudley and Les Jackson. So Rick used to be the GM of uh, Florida. Now he's director of player personnel and Les Jackson, who was GM with Dallas for years. And uh, now he's, um, you know, he's assistant to the GM in Florida. He's got some particular work, but we were both in, we were in Prague, Czechoslovakia, late February, early March, just before, you know, the final stretch here. Both of those guys were the I'm not even sure the team was going to make the playoffs at that time. So just mm-hmm. to give you an example, it was like, well, let's meet in Florida. And, if they're, and they're like, well, we don't even know if we're going to make the playoffs. We had a tough road ahead of us. And, you know, I think they got in the last couple of days of the regular season. So yeah. just to show you what they did was incredible. It really was. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I guess, Pat, let's start off with you. Let's kind of get to know you. Uh, I guess you sure. kind of told us a little bit. Uh, you're from Canada, but uh, where are you from? So I was born in Toronto, uh, just uh, North York area. And uh, then we moved to Georgetown, Ontario when I was quite young. Uh, and then back to Toronto where uh, you know, we played minor hockey with the Toronto Red Wings growing up. And then uh, from there, um, I, geez, I left home when I was 16, went to play pro hockey in Italy when I was 16 to become Italian. And I came back to play junior for the Ottawa 67s. I uh, had a little stint with Prince Albert in the WH hockey, uh, WHL, the Western Hockey League, and then I uh, went pro in Dallas, where I played for the Dallas Freeze, and that, that was unbelievable because uh, we were had such a big crowd, such a big uh, fan base. That that's why the Minnesota North Stars moved down there. Yeah, And then, uh, you know, went to a couple training camps, played a little bit in the ECHL, and then went back to Europe. I uh, played a year in, uh, in Milan, and then... Uh, the European borders at that time, the world was changing. It was uh, the Euro, Euro was coming in, the borders were opening up, and uh, we all, everyone with European passports, were being bought by every country that was allowed to have um, European players as non imports. Uh, so I ended up getting into Germany, where I played uh, until about 2001. So, you know, went from about 1990, 1989 maybe to 2001, kicking around everywhere I could. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, my son was actually born in Hanover, Germany, in 1999. So it's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that, yeah, that's that's a, a really cool and fun story too to think about. You know, just because I think people, you know, a, a lot of times we think of of hockey and it, it's really branched into the NHL. You either make it to the NHL or you don't. Because I think that's kind of an American thing. Because in college, you know, and and in, in uh, American football, you know, you have college and you hope to make it to the NFL. If you don't make it to the NFL, you're probably really not doing much uh, other than maybe some of these smaller leagues, maybe an indoor football league or something like that, but nothing too major where in hockey, it really seems like there's a lot more, uh, a lot wider. Uh, it's much broader of, of a, a a realm that you can go a lot of places with it. And it's, it's really exciting to kind of hear other guys' stories. Uh, my uncle, he was very big into hockey. I think he was one of the higher recruits here in, in, uh, in, in Iowa whenever he was in high school and uh, really good goalie at the time and didn't end up going and, and, and kind of fulfilling his career or anything like that, but ended up staying back with, with family and stuff like that. But it's always fun to kind of see where a lot of guys and he's got friends that, that can tell stories about where, where all they've been. It's, it's really fun to kind of hear how hockey can take young guys all over the globe. Big time. Well, our business, you know, I, I, is we're Optimal World Sports. We represent the majority of players that play overseas and in the KHL. And when you talk about it, you know, it's such a global game. We're talking about Sweden, Finland, Austria, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Slovakia, UK, France, Denmark, Norway, Russia, 
all these countries have their own top leagues, and I'm, I'm probably missing a couple off the top of my head, but uh, I don't even know if I said Finland. But uh, and every league uh, has you know so many imports they can have. Some leagues have no have an import rule that they can have as many as they want. So there's a huge market uh, for these players that you know if they're not playing in the National Hockey League, they can have a much better lifestyle than kicking around the American League and the ECHL make more money, play less games, and, and live in these beautiful parts of the world. So that's our business. Um, you know, Optum World Sports started about 30 years ago. They represented me when I played. And, um, you know, several years back, Brett Callaghan and Ron Chipperfield both were Edmonton Oilers in the early days. They started the company with Gary Seigo, and they wanted to retire. And I just got fired from, I don't know, maybe my 20th coaching gig. <laughs> and uh, they're like, you know, maybe it's time for you to consider doing this. You've been doing it your whole life. You might as well do it now you know, for real. And that's kind of how the whole thing started several years ago. I ended up taking over part of the company when they retired. So it was, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a good seven year run so far and uh, hopefully we can do it for the next 20 years. Yeah. And you, you said something about, uh, you know, just a minute ago about how you, you started skating as, as soon as you could, you could walk. Um, but, uh, did I hear hear it correctly that you're actually a first generation, uh, hockey player in your family, correct? Yes, yes. So both my parents came from Italy. So I was the first, uh, you know, born in Canada. I was the oldest in my family. So hockey was never a, a thought on anyone's, you know, radar. And yeah. um, you know, I met some friends when I was probably five, six years old that were neighbors down the street that were into hockey, uh, and they got me into it. And uh, the passion just fueled and never stopped. And you know, we were playing in the backyard and rinks. We had a fire department behind our house, and they had this uh, sphere that they used to, you know, use for training and it was kind of like a two foot block of concrete in a circle where they would put out fires and stuff. But in the winter they would freeze it for the kids. And we had our own little skating rink in the back, you know, not your typical pond, but it was the fire department that made it for us. And we skated there day and night. I still remember jumping the fence from my backyard to get over the top and <laughs> go skate. And it, there was lights, they put lights up for us. And uh, it was great. We, for years, we, we couldn't wait to, for that rink to be ready in the winter. So that's how it all got started. And, you know, the rest is kind of history, how my passion went from, you know, playing to coaching to being the agent that I am now and uh, just helping players uh, realize, try to re get them to realize their dreams and, and follow and pursue them. And, you know, did it as a coach and, you know, doing it as an agent. So it's it's uh, it's fulfilling, it really is. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And I, I guess, was there was there a point in your life where you feel like it was the, the central point uh, that you kind of realized that hockey would be your lifetime career? Not really. I mean, I think it was always, it wasn't easy. Like there was always mm -hmm. fights, you know, per, you know, there was times where you weren't sure you're going to get a job as a player. You weren't sure you're going to get a job as a coach. Uh, you know, I could tell you some crazy stories, you know, just how I became the coach with the London Knights, you know, and Dale Hunter, and Mark Hunter. And we had John Carlson, Nazem Kadri, John Tavares, Phil Veroni, Zach Ronaldo. Man, the, the list of players that we had uh, over the few years that are in the NHL. Pat Kane had just been drafted first overall. Sam Gagne was just drafted fifth or sixth by the Edmonton Oilers. Um, so th th that was the time that I kind of got in. But I was coaching minor hockey with the Toronto Red Wings. And the owner, we had a fantastic year. And the owner uh, bought the Pickering Panthers Junior A team in Ontario. And he's like, you know, I want you to come coach this team. The kids need some passion. They need some some structure and so i ended up taking the bad news bears i guess you could call them the pickering panthers they were dead last they hadn't made the playoffs in six or seven years and we we ended up getting a team that made the playoffs and we went uh, the first round went to game seven we won in game seven uh, we, we played the longest overtime history game at the time it was like five overtime periods it was crazy uh, we went to game seven in the semis we won we ended up losing in the finals but through that playoff run you know, kind of really kickstarted things. And this was, I think, 2000 and, oh, man, 2005. It's going way back, almost 20 years ago. And um, I was just talking to guys, and I heard the London Knights needed uh, an assistant coach. Uh, Dave Gagne was there, who had coached against me in minor hockey, and, and Dave now represents Connor McDavid. And Dave's like, you got to go to the NHL draft in Columbus. I said, well, how am I going to get to Columbus? I mean, like Toronto, the drafts in two days. He goes, you got to find your way there, and you got to meet Dale. You got to just go find Dale Hunter and meet Dale Hunter. So at the time, I was like, okay, I'll do it. And uh, I was still helping out Ian Palver and John Walters, uh, friends of mine from Will Sports at the time. They represent Tyler Sagan and a bunch of players, but they were just starting in the business. And one of their first clients was Dale Mitchell. 
and he was rated to go in the third round with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so Dale, uh, I knew, and I said, Dale, I'm going to drive down to Columbus. I know you wanted to go to the draft. You weren't sure how you're going to get there. And he's in Windsor. I know he was in Mississauga. We're going to go through Windsor. He ended up getting playing for Windsor. And uh, I said, I'll pick you up. And he goes, my mom wants to come. I said, okay, let's go. So the three of us jumped in the car and we drove to Columbus. Dale ended up being drafted by Toronto in the third round. He was Toronto's first pick at that year because they didn't have a first and second. And I spent the first two days looking to track down Dale Hunter, just just bump into him somewhere. And I met uh, a guy named Randy Clark, who was Dale Hunter's best friend from Petrolia. They were farmers together. And uh, I don't know how I got introduced to Randy, but the funny thing about Randy was we always joke around that Randy was my agent. But Randy, I started telling him we were having a beer and I said, I need to meet Dale. He goes, oh, he's going to be here. Just stick around. So I waited at this bar for Dale for about five hours till Dale Hunter walked in. And sure enough, he walked in. I went right up to him, had a beer with him. We started talking hockey. We sat there and talked hockey until about two in the morning. I must have bugged Dale from that moment. The draft was the end of June. I bugged him every day from the end of June till the end of July until finally he called and hired me. <laughs> wow. So that, that's how I got in with the London Knights. And then uh, the rest was kind of history. But, um, you know, you have to be persistent. Uh, the game really... You know, unless you're a first round pick and even a lot of them have had some hurdles, you, you've got to stay true to yourself. You've got to work hard. You've got to be persistent is a, is a key I like to use all the time. Uh, you're going to get shot down more times than you can ever imagine. And you got to keep getting up and keep trying to get in there and find ways as a player is the same thing and until you get to where you want to go. So uh, yeah. that was kind of the kickstart for my coaching career. Hey guys, I just want to interrupt this episode real quick. Uh, we will get back to the interview, I promise, but we have to mention an amazing sponsor of ours, a sponsor that you do not want to miss out on, a sponsor that needs an introduction because we have to get into the sponsor, but that is Big Frig. Big Frig is an amazing sponsor. It's also an amazing product. We say that about all of our sponsors because we don't pick sponsors that are going to be bad products and products that are hard to sell. We're picking sponsors that have a product or a service that is easy to sell to you because we want you to got you guys as our listeners to have the best products of whatever it is that we're trying to sell you. And we're only trying to sell it to you because listen, you need it. And Big Frig is one of those things. You need to go check them out. Bigfrig.com. That's B-I-G-F-R-I-G.com. And you can use code RISING220. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-2-0. And guess what? If you use that code, It'll give you 20% off the most amazing coolers or tumblers, whatever you want to do. All right. You want to go and get yourself a nice 20 ounce tumbler like I've got right here, the 20 ounce tumblers. This is absolutely the best. Uh, it, it kind of looks small, honestly. And I felt like, man, this one's too small. I don't know if, if this is going to be enough, but then I realized, man, it's 20 ounces. It holds 20 ounces in here. That is plenty. That is plenty of coffee to get me through my day. I fill this thing up in the morning, put my coffee in it and I'm good to go. It keeps it nice and warm for me. I take it on a golf course with me, whatever the case may be. I make sure to fill it up with some Mahler Bros coffee because that's the best coffee to go. But Big Frig keeps my Mahler Bros golf coffee all nice and warm. All right, it keeps it feeling fresh, tasting fresh. It's an amazing product. Their tumblers, 100% recommend. Their coolers, on the other hand, you go over and check out their Badlands coolers. Their Badlands coolers are the baddest. We have an, a, a, a short little video that we've actually uploaded here a little while back that you can go check out. It's a review of the Badlands coolers. They're an amazing thing. They're, they are the best cooler on the market. All right, I used to think that there was, other, there was other brands that might beat out just about anybody, but Badlands, the Badlands uh, Big Frig coolers are the best. You go and check them out. They have all kinds of accessories that go with them. The locks that are on them are amazing. They are probably the best cooler locks I've ever seen, felt, or used. And not only that, but they've got bottle openers that are attached, basically just kind of part of the cooler. That's amazing for tailgating, for uh, going on, on camping trips, whatever you use it for. That's amazing. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. They've also got a cutting board divider in the middle of them, a little basket that sits inside of them as an accessory. You can upgrade your handle. You can add your own logos to them. Whatever you want to do, Big Frig is the place to go. Their coolers, their tumblers, it's all the best products that I can find on the market. And I'm recommending them to you. Go check them out, bigfrig.com. That's B-I-G-F-R-I-G.com. And use code RISING220. 
That's B-I-G-F-R-I-G dot com and use code R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-2-0. Get yourself 20% off. I promise you, you will not regret it. It is going to be the best products that you have ever used. Whether you get their coolers or their tumblers, I promise you, you're going to love them. But I don't want to take any more of your time. You already know Big Frig is the place to go. So let's get back to the interview. Yeah, that's that's an awesome story too to know that you know it just came from you just sitting there and bugging because I think a lot of times, yeah, yeah, at least for my personality, I'm kind of that way where I feel that you know I, I'll reach out to somebody once and if I don't hear back from, them, I feel awkward reaching out a second time. Should I should I reach out again? And I'll go ahead and reach out that second yeah. time, but I really don't want to bug them to the point where they just completely <laughs> ignore me. But I, you're right. I think pers- persistence is the key because. It's the answer is already no, uh, and that's kind of you know what yeah. my what my dad always taught me when I was younger. I'd always uh, sit there and kind of shy around asking a question or something like that, and he'd tell me, you know, why why are you why are you so shy about asking a question if the, the answer is already no if you never asked it? Uh, so yeah, that's that's that's, that's right. a really cool yeah, story that you you're able to kind of bug him enough to, for him to finally kind of give in. Um, but you know, yeah, Pat, you you've played all over the globe. You've played in a lot of different places, uh, both America and uh, all over Europe and all, all, all sorts of really cool places. Uh, for either your playing career or your coaching career, what was your favorite place to play? Oh, okay. we got some great stories. I don't know if you have enough time on this podcast, but Hanover <laughs> Scorpions was unbelievable because, uh, oh man, where do I start? Uh, this, the stories are endless. So I was playing in Ravensburg, Germany, which is actually was the Zweite Bundesliga at the time, which means the second league. And the Hanover Scorpions, were the, they were the Vedemark Scorpions at the time, were their first year in the DEL, which is the Erste Bundesliga at the time. Now it's the DEL. And I had a bunch of guys on that team, and the team was struggling, and they're like, if you can get from Ravensburg, just get up here, you're going to play. So I had a contract in Ravensburg, which is in the south in Germany, near Munich and Bavaria, and, and Hanover is closer to the top near Hamburg. And uh, you're probably talking six, seven hours on the train. And uh, I had gone in to see the coach at the time. He was a guy from Manitoba. And, uh, oh, man, the name, I can't remember the coach's name. But I said, look, I got to make this team. I need to get up there. I need to just get on the train and go play for the Hanover Scorpions. My buddy told me if I just show up, they're going to give me a chance. And he's like, you're crazy. You're making like $50,000 here. You're just going to throw that away to go try out with the team. I said, yeah, but I know I can make it and I got to just go. Sure enough, I left Ravensburg. Everyone thought it was nuts. I took the train up to Vedemark. I literally got off the train and that morning. I had left at midnight, so it was like the red eye. I got up, practiced with the team, played the next night in Vedemark, ended up spending the next five years there. But the GM was ended up becoming my very good friend, and he would come to Toronto where we'd sign players. And uh, the, one of the biggest sponsors was the rock band, the Scorpions. They rocked me like a hurricane, so we were with them all the time. Uh, it was unbelievable. Rudolf Schenker, the lead guitarist, and oh man, the stories were crazy. Uh, but it was an unbelievable run. That's where my son was born. We still do work with Hanover today. We have players on their team now. They're still going. Uh, they went from the DEL. Now they're in the third league, but they're trying to win and move their way back up. And, uh, but you know, you're talking almost 25 years ago, maybe longer now. But yeah, and uh, so it's incre- incredible. But Hanover was a great experience. Uh, a lot of friends, a lot of memories. Uh, the coach that coached us there, Kevin Godet, he's still coaching there in Hanover. Uh, he's obviously had many different stops from between when I played and now, but somehow he's found his way right back to Hanover. So, um, yeah, the stories were – it was an unbelievable place to play. It really was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had quite a few friends from, from Germany and stuff too. So, you know, even knowing just, uh, you know, in the Hanover area and stuff like that, that, been, that would – Definitely be one of the one of the cooler places to visit. Uh, let alone being able to play there, coach there, uh, be a part of a team there too. That, that sounds like a blast. Um, I, 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 I've also seen in, in some research that uh, you were a part of maybe uh, maybe even finding uh, or I guess being the founder or president, uh, and then also the the head coach of a team out in San Francisco. Uh, I guess kind of tell us about that. What 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 all goes into starting up a a franchise oh, and kind of helping build it from the from the ground up. 2010, uh, I had coached, I moved, uh, left to, left the London Knights. Um, I left the London Knights because a good friend of mine uh, was going to buy the Las Vegas Wranglers. And uh, he said, I'm buying the team. It's a done deal. You're going to be coaching GM, put in a resignation with London, and going to take care of you. So shook his hand, whole deal was going to be done. 
And uh, about three months into the whole process, this is, uh, I want to say, June 2009, um, we, we fly to Vegas, we meet with the owners, uh, everything looks like it's going to happen. One hiccup is the Orleans Arena, which is still there today, um, they would not renew the lease past the following two years. So there was two years left in the lease and they didn't want to renew it. They wanted to get past those two years. Well, the owner that agreed to buy the team and hire me as the GM coach was like, we cannot continue with this purchase without a lease. Where are we going to play? Anyways, uh, over the next 60, 90 days, well, 60 days, the deal fell apart. He had agreed to pay me still for the two years, um, but I had no job. So my good friend, Kevin Culley, was in Utah. He says, I need you. Come coach with me in Utah. Same league. You'll get to know Vegas. We play them 20 times. You know, kind of crazy thing. So I got in my car and drove to Utah. It was uh, crazy, but uh, the story is crazy. Is that the first two weeks in Utah, I, I bump into my wife, who's now my wife at the airport. I stay in Utah. 2010, after that year, uh, we start talking again to the league about a new franchise. Uh, my wife and I were sitting at the kitchen table and we're like, you know, where would it work? And we knew Stockton was successful. We knew San Francisco had a big hockey fan base and, uh, the only problem, again, we probably should have learned the Cow Palace wasn't the perfect place to have a hockey team. It was such an old barn. But uh, from there, we started. And, uh, man, it was a lot of work from the name to the colors to the, getting the ownership group together, uh, building the team from scratch, finding the NHL partnerships, the affiliations we found with San Jose. Uh, we did it all. And uh, it was a lot of work, but it was uh, it was an unbelievable experience for, for a few years. And, and uh it was too bad because we had a great thing going and we knew the American League was going to come out to the West. Uh, we just couldn't hang on with the ownership group we had. And the state of California was very difficult to deal with at the time. And we couldn't keep the team going. But uh, it, it was a great, great experience. It was, a, I could say, a lot of money was lost, unfortunately, but it was a great experience. And uh, I see now Lake Tahoe is going to get a team in Nevada. I think Nevada is a much oh, better really? state for yeah for for the echl with just because the state for doing business i guess but yeah uh, it was an unbelievable experience and uh you know we ran it all it was coach gm i was even driving the zamboni i was painting the <laughs> ice we built the scoreboard we bought the merchandise you know we went out and sold season tickets we were in the media every day uh, it wasn't just coaching the team that was the easy part yeah, yeah it was everything else we, we did it all yeah 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 it's it's really cool too to just think of what it would take to just get get a, a franchise started up you know right now i'm I, I right around sioux city area uh and i've, I've mm -hmm. seen quite a few different uh you know sports teams try to start up in sioux city and it just of course this isn't uh, this isn't a big market at all so uh it's not going to be easy to start it up in a smaller market like this but you know to go to a big market like that in san francisco it's really cool to kind of see uh you know how much work it would take to kind of build everything from the ground up like that that's that's really cool and uh, really really fun to hear about too and uh like you said too it's it's really cool that you were able to have some good experiences through it and everything too and kind of look back well, on those days as, as good old there. memories oh man for sure we met everybody we were at the san francisco giants games we met the president and we were on their wall behind home base or the, the boards behind home home base uh, we, did, we had meetings with the mayor. The mayor came and wife escorted the mayor onto the ice. He's dropping the puck. Like we had everybody. Like it was it was the perfect storm. And the NHL went on strike. The first game was sold out, 9,000 fans. It was uh, 2012. That was October 2012. And, uh, it was great. And we, we deserve a lot of credit that people don't really give us credit for what we built there. Uh, but uh, it was an incredible franchise, incredible team incredible group of people we still represent guys that played for me guys like brett finley uh that were on the team back then he was just a young guy coming out of junior he's still playing pro now in europe we represent him guys like riley brace who now is an american league hockey league referee uh so there's so many guys that are still still going from the san francisco days but uh it was a lot of great memories yeah and i i think hockey is one of those one of those sports too that it's kind of building relationships in, in pretty much every stop you make too. That's what I've, what I've learned from different hockey players that I've, that I've known and uh, that I've talked to is just 
hearing how you know they were they only played for six months over uh, maybe in Mankato, but but they get they made so many so many uh, not not even just friends, but what what they were consider family now, on uh, just how how close knit the hockey world is. It's it's really cool, uh, and, and you've even mentioned Darn. some names that I that I know too. And I know just a a little while ago you named you mentioned uh, Sam Gagne. Uh, and he actually came from yeah. the USHL league. He was playing for the Sioux City Musketeers here, so that, that was that's kind right. of cool. And kind of knew him a little Year bit back then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's so right. it's yeah. it's really cool to see how 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 small of a world it, it is whenever you you talk about the hockey world and how uh, it just seems like so many people uh, are are kind of integrated with one another, and you may not even know it. Um, but yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Kind of going into it now. So you said now you're a sports agent currently. Uh, you know, for for those of us who are fans, we kind of look at the, the season, you know, the season starts here and ends here, but for an agent like yourself, the season doesn't ever really end. You're, you're kind of constantly trying to help out and work out different deals and constantly doing things, uh, is, is right now maybe the, the busier part of, of your, 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 I guess, off season. Oh man, it's crazy. My, this is my, my call list that I make every morning for myself. There's about 20 players on there, several GMs. Uh, so it's nonstop. We're on the yeah. phone here. My other phone's going crazy with text messages. It's nonstop. And everyone asks, well, what's the busiest time of year? Well, for us, it's kind of annual, really. I mean, we have, you know, there's always a certain amount of players that you're signing, you know, for the following year. So to give you an example, in Europe, February 15th for most countries is the deadline. After that day, you can't sign another player for the current season. So as soon as that day comes and goes, all the teams really start focusing on the following year. So it starts from February 15th until the following February 15th. Teams always trying to sign players, get better, move players, not happy with players. Someone gets hurt, whatever. It's nonstop, right? Not, it's not just building your team and you're done. You know, you're always making changes as a GM. Try to improve everything you can do to that last minute to try to make your team better is what we do every day working with these teams. And we all have our, you know, I have a few partners with Gary and Dave and, Sully here and Dimitri, you know, we all have our markets, but we all, we have a chat that's just going nonstop. And so it's, it, it's pretty hectic. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Cause like I said, for, for fans, you know, we, we know when the season starts and when it ends, you know, and we're just ready for the off season to, to, to just get over with where, you know, players and, and coaches and agents, you know, you're kind of constantly working. You're, you've got something constantly to get ready for. And it's, it's, it's really cool to kind of see the behind the scenes. Like you said, you know, the, the list, you know, a lot of us, we, we just think, well, you know, that's the off season for you. You can go off and go to, go to the Cancun and kick it back on the beach and, yeah. you know, have yourself a nice cola right. and, and chill out. But no, it's not quite the case, but not uh, at all. Not at all. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've seen tons of, of posts from you and, and social media, especially since, since learning more about you and, and getting you on as a, as a guest, I've seen a lot of posts from you about cryptocurrency and I've looked into it, you know, I've, I've gotten into crypto cryptocurrency a little bit myself. Uh, and so, you know, mm -hmm. I've kind of, kind of known a little bit about it anyways, we've got a basic knowledge of it. Um, but you're, you're kind of getting into a different form of cryptocurrency where you're actually trying to help players get paid into cryptocurrency. Uh, you're part of the, part of a team that that's, kind of uh, moving moving that direction. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I guess the, the easiest way to tell you is we're trying to bring teams into Web Web 3 to teams. Basically, the, the fantastic technology of Web 3, we want to be able to bring all those benefits to these pro clubs. And one of them, of course, is paying players in crypto. If you're into crypto, you know how easy it is to move money. I can have a player in Russia. His wife can be in Iowa. You know, send money instantly via crypto. You connect it to your wallet now. I could have it connected to my bank account. I mean, it's seamless transactions. You don't need banks. You don't need borders. You don't need to pay all these fees. You don't have to lose money in exchanges, currency exchanges. Million different reasons why it's it's amazing. But there were so many other factors. But that was the initial thought process. But now bringing Web3 to the teams and the benefits of all the Web3 to the teams uh, it's real exciting. We're going to give teams the ability to create digital assets, things like NFTs that will have utility. You know, teams can do things like if they offer these NFTs, uh, fans can get in to vote on the starting five lineup. You know, they can vote on the three stars. They can get discounts on merchandise. You know, they can do things like get into VIP rooms, uh, come to events to meet the players that are unique, open practices, um, all kinds of different things that we can create for the clubs. And that's what we're starting to see now. And we know the, tr the 
you know, the shift is happening. Uh, and we can do things like tickets. Uh, teams can now go directly to uh, fans and create tickets for them. They don't have to go through third parties like Ticketmaster and all these other things that charge these teams massive fees. Uh, so all these benefits uh, we're bringing with Web3 to the clubs and uh, not easy to make change. But I think that uh, when you start to see some of the clubs implementing these digital assets and creating live moments, guys score an overtime goal, all of a sudden that video gets minted. It's one of a kind. It's an NFT. They're able to put it up for auction. Fans are going to want that stuff. So uh, we're excited with, about what we're doing, and uh, you know it's right up my alley here to try to help these clubs create new revenue streams and you know create greater fan engagement with with their fans. Who without the fans, what are we? We, we have nothing. They're so important. So it's important that uh, we're able to engage with them and and do things like this that I think is going to bring them closer to us. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have at least heard of cryptocurrency. I think it's been you know, rapidly growing. Uh, and like you said, I, I do, I do see some future in, in a cryptocurrency. Um, but maybe, maybe for those who aren't, aren't as familiar with it, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if, if you're an office fan at all, explain it to me like I'm five, uh, you know, just kind of yeah. explain, explain how the cryptocurrency, because a lot of people, I think they look at it and they, they get confused with the cryptocurrencies, because if you think of things like Ethereum or Bitcoin and some of these, these major, mm -hmm. uh, these major cryptos are constantly moving. So, uh, if you were to pay, you know, a lot of people might have the understanding that if you're pay pay a player, you know, let's say five five Bitcoin today, tomorrow it might not be worth that. And so, uh, you know, how how does that kind of kind of go uh, into the the process and the planning for for paying these players? Yeah. So the idea would be uh, not to pay them in Bitcoin or or Ethereum or Polygon or Solana or any of these cryptos. There's, there's stable coins that are tied to the U.S. dollar, for example, like USDT or USDC. And so because they're tied to the U.S. dollar, their fluctuation is just par with the dollar. So they, it, they trade just like a cryptocurrency. They move just like cryptocurrency on the blockchain. They're just their tokens. But you would pay it to you pay players in USDC so they wouldn't have that volatility. So if a guy was making 100,000 U.S. dollars, he's making 100,000 U.S. dollars getting paid in USDT. Same thing, right? Uh, if it's euros, you can have uh, the you know the euros has a stable coin that's pegged to the euro, uh, so you don't have that fluctuation. So that's what we would recommend. Unless you know, there's been some players that wanted to be paid in Bitcoin. There's a few football players that did, and luckily it's coming back now. I think maybe the worst. I hope the worst is over, but uh, there were some volatile times here the last 18 months, and um, so that's basically what we would recommend to players. You get paid in a stable coin that uh, is not volatile so you're not going to lose any money or you're not going to make any money it's just that's what you're getting paid in us dollar exact same thing so that's what we would say and then you control it with your own wallet and uh that that's the easiest way to explain it and then yeah. you know cryptocurrency moves on the blockchain you know it's fully disclosed you can go on the blockchain see every transaction uh it, it is truly an amazing technology I and mean, i'm a big believer that uh you know if you ever had to move large large sums of money uh, you really realize how beneficial crypto is for moving money around the world. And, you know, us in the U.S. and Canada or Europe, even we're fortunate. You know, we have banks and all these things. But if you go into these some of these countries, Africa, Japan, China, it's not easy. You know, with Bitcoin, they're able to really have control of their finances. So it's an exciting technology. And I think it's the future for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Really, really exciting and and, and just interesting to see how much the the future is really already here uh and it's it's crazy to think that you know when when even when when i was younger when i was a kid uh some of the things that we have nowadays that is just kind of mind-boggling and even even backing up just before my time and and the things that i that i've seen i feel like i feel like my generation has has definitely seen it all uh kind of coming to light you know and seeing what the future is actually bringing and, and cryptocurrency being one of them it's really cool uh, to hear that you you and and many other people are trying to to work to kind of bring this this kind of to light to make sure that that players can kind of get paid in a way like you said it's much simpler much faster uh, it's just a, a a better way of, of of payment form so that's that's really cool to kind of hear you explain that and and all the work that's kind of being put into it but uh, Pat I yeah, think that's pretty much really exciting. Yeah, yeah yeah absolutely but Pat I, I think that's pretty much all we have for you today I really thank you for coming on the show awesome. uh, I guess do you have any shout outs that you want to give or anything you want to kind of give a shout out to that maybe we didn't get to 
No, I just thank thanks for having us. And they're myself, you know, especially. And uh, it's always exciting to talk hockey, talk stories, talk about uh, Locker Token and Web three and everything we're doing. And um, you know, we're excited to just move this all forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was it was great to have you on. It's always fun to hear uh, the the stories kind of behind the scenes from other people that have actually been there in different different leagues and stuff like that. And it's uh, it was definitely a blast to have you on. But for everyone watching, awesome. listening, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For everyone watching, listening, we thank you so much for all of your support. Make sure to go follow us on social media. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and hit that notification bell. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, give us a five-star review. That is the greatest way to help us out. We thank you all for watching, for listening, and until next time.